So let's take a look at uh, part four, which uh, is indicated is the most important part, most important section of the discourse on method. Uh, the, you'll instantly recognize uh, certain things about it, just if you breeze through it for a first look. That is uh, very famous things that Descartes said, the most famous things that Descartes said, some of the most famous things that any Western philosopher has ever said. Uh, the famous cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And the notion that uh, of the thinking thing, of the thinking substance, there are two very closely related concepts in, in, in Descartes' thought. But what is he really doing here? I mean, we've been given the method. We were given the method uh, of the title, what's advertised in the title uh, in, in part two. Uh, and in part three, he described how he, he lived by the method, at least insofar as, uh, on the one hand, the method, the first rule of the method, uh, required him to only accept as true those things which he conceived of clearly and distinctly, which are very few things, right? Um, and we have to talk about whether that's completely incoherent to say that what you conceive clearly and distinctly uh, is true because there's a danger of circularity. Work it out for yourself. Uh, whatever I conceive uh, clearly and distinctly is true. Uh, well, uh, what is what are those statements that are clear and distinct? Well, the ones that are most obviously true. I mean, it doesn't have to go that way. It doesn't have to be circular. But what clarity and distinction mean in terms of uh, cognition? That is, in terms of of, of, of knowing. Uh, is uh, terribly uh, indeterminate, and, and, and no doubt Descartes does something to try to clear that up, but whether he's successful or not is a question. But what is he doing in part four? Well, yes, he has already applied uh, the method uh, to mathematics, and he has otherwise lived uh, like skeptic, you know, according to the criterion of, well, I don't know the truth, but I might as well follow the customs of my country, and he has other maxims that he lives by to, to, to be resolute, even though one's knowledge of the path that one on, one's on is, is, is incomplete, uh, to try to conquer himself rather than the world. These are just the old-fashioned ethical maxims that go back thousands of years. Nothing terribly original about them. Uh, but what is it going on in part four? Again, he has put off a thoroughgoing application of the method for years. He's done mathematics, he's done some science, and, and we'll see the results of his science, and it's pretty sobering, uh, the results of the, the science that he does. What has he done? He, yeah, he's done these things, these particular things, but he has put off the thoroughgoing foundational application of the method. That is, to ask himself, not only to apply it in mathematics, to try to start with the clearest principles and then be very careful about how one builds on those to attain other truths, and supposed truths in mathematics. To ask himself the most basic questions about the principles, what, what, what principles really are principles. And, and this engagement is a philosophical engagement. More particularly, it's a metaphysical one. So we look at part four, the first line of part four. I do not know. I do not know whether I ought to tell you about the first meditations I engaged in there. That is, once he had moved to Holland and uh, had the quiet seclusion of time to do a thoroughgoing application of method. He's being coy. I do not know whether I ought to tell you about the first meditations I engaged in there, for they are so metaphysical and so out of the ordinary that perhaps they will not to everyone's liking. And yet, in order that it should be possible to judge whether the foundations I have laid, these are the real foundations, are sufficiently firm, I find myself in some sense forced to talk about them. That is, the philosophical engagement here is a metaphysical engagement. And that means that the questions that he's asking are the kind of truths that he's, and the kind of truths that he's trying to get are metaphysical truths. That is, truths that transcend ideas, one would say, about subjects that transcend the ordinary limits of our possible experience. Something that is metaphysical is something that, that transcends 
our ordinary ability to know. It would be something that we would try to talk about without having direct experience of it. One may think of metaphysical in that way, and may also may think of metaphysical in the sense of trying to describe the basic structure of reality, the most fundamental aspects of, uh, of reality. And that's exactly what you're doing here. He says, for a long time, I had noticed that in matters of morality, one must sometimes follow opinions that one knows to be quite uncertain, just as if they were indubitable, undoubtable. As has been said above, but because I then desired to devote myself exclusively to the search for the truth, I thought it necessary that I do exactly the opposite, <laughs> and that I reject as absolutely false <clears throat> everything in which I could imagine the least doubt, in order to see whether, after this process, something in my beliefs remained that was entirely indubitable. So the opposite of uh, trying on moral beliefs, even though they're uncertain, uh, and living by them, would be to subject every uncertain belief to doubt and on the basis of any dubitability, any doubtableness, to reject it, to put it aside. Not to say that it's false, because that would be the claim to know it's false. And that, that would be just as dogmatic from you know, say, a skeptical sexist point of view as to say that it's true. But to put it aside, to suspend one's judgment, if there's any room for doubt. So then the game that Descartes playing becomes, of course, and this is what leads directly to the I think, therefore I am, the game becomes finding something that cannot be doubted. And, and that's exactly what he finds. And this is a very well-known little uh, episode in the history of philosophy. Descartes subjects everything to doubt. Uh, he subjects everything that he seems to have learned through his senses, because he knows that the senses sometimes deceive them, deceives him, so he can throw that all away. He even uh, rejects all the reasonings that he had previously taken for demonstration, that is, all the reasonings in mathematics. He knows that others, and probably himself, are oftentimes wrong uh, in their reasonings, uh, in their deductive reasoning. Uh, so if you can be wrong in deductive reasoning, that means that any particular reasoning has some possibility of being wrong, so it's, it's doubtable. So throw all that away. Uh, he even throws away uh, his notion that he's living in the world, that he's not asleep. You know, that, that is, we're fooled when we dream that things that are, seem real, but aren't, are real. You know, we, we think that we're in the world in our dreams. And, and it, it seems very vivid and, and, and very real, but of course we wake and we realize that it's not true. Well, if we can be so fooled about the reality of a, an external world, material world, nature, in our dreams, could we not be fooled all the time? So let's throw that away, too. The belief that we are here in the rooms we're in, or the places we're in, and that we're surrounded by physical objects and other people in the universe, we can throw that away, too, or put it aside. Because we find that all of these beliefs, on whatever level, specific or general, that they're all doubtable. So then the idea is, is there anything that's not doubtable? And of course, this leads to the famous line. But immediately afterward, that is in this process of doubting things, I noticed that while I wanted thus to think that everything was false, it necessarily had to be the case that I, who was thinking, was something. And noticing that this truth, I think therefore I am, was so firm and so assured that all the most extravagant suppositions of the skeptics were incapable of shaking it, I judged that I could accept it without scruple as the first principle of the philosophy I was speaking. Very famous and, and, and very um, dramatic and uh, very questionable. Uh, what cannot be doubted that I'm thinking, because even doubting is a form of thinking, uh, that I exist. And uh, because I guess someone has to be doing the thinking. Uh, my own existence and the reliance of my knowledge of my own existence on the fact that I'm thinking and imagining are these, are, that's the very foundation, the first principle of philosophy. So we'll have to move on from there and see where it gets us.